Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Rebecca Marquez, uh, coordinator, Business Intelligence Coordinator with PMMI. Today we're going to hear from Chris Steele, Research and Consulting Economist with ITR Economics. Chris will be covering the findings of PMMI's first quarter 2017 quarterly economic outlook report. Chris is an economist at ITR Economics. He provides economic consulting services with a great deal of insight and action-oriented advice for small businesses, trade associations, and Fortune 500 companies. Chris has also brought in-depth insights of industry trends to the ITR Economics team with his willingness to go above and beyond in his daily research for our clients. Chris has graduated from UMass Amherst with a BA in economics and served six years in the National Guard. His attention to detail, ability to understand a client's specific needs, and organizational skills create an enjoyable partnership with each of his clients. Today, Chris will interpret the information included in the quarterly outlook and provide insight on how today's economy may be affecting your packaging and processing operations. If you have any questions that you would like to ask Chris, please type your question in the chat box that is located in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. At the end of this presentation, which will last approximately 30 to 40 minutes, he will answer your questions. At this point, I would like to hand the webinar over to Chris with ITR Economics. Thank you, Rebecca, uh, and thank you, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, and um, thank you for joining our first quarter of 2017 market forecast webinar. Uh, before I get into the, uh, the meat and gravy of our report, I'd like to give you a little bit of an overview of what I'll be discussing today. Uh, first off, I will be presenting um, ITR's uh, overall U.S. macroeconomic uh, outlook um, for the next three years. I want to do this to call your expectations, um, regardless of um, any of the specific industries which you might be involved in, so that you have a good backdrop of the overall uh, fundamental and foundational economics that are moving behind the scenes. After that, I'm going to uh, jump into the details on a variety of uh, different market forecasts uh, that we've prepared for PMMI and how they relate to uh, different industries and segments of the economy. Finally, I'd like to give a brief overview of uh, the closing data of 2016 um, for a variety of different international segments. Uh, after that, as Rebe uh, Rebecca mentioned earlier, I will kick it back to her for questions, um, and I look forward to hearing all of your uh, feedback and inquiries. However, before that, uh, before I get into the uh, actual data and the actual report, I would like to go over briefly um, our proprietary terminology and methodology that we use here at ITR. If you have joined us before for any of our previous uh, market webinars, uh, you know that we here at ITR, as uh, long-term business cycle theorists, um, do things a little differently than uh, many economic forecasting firms uh, and many uh, traditional statistical forecasting firms. So whether you are a first-time listener to our webinar or you are a long-term listener uh, and you just need a uh, brief brush up on uh, exactly what I'm saying and, and uh, what our different terminology and methodology means, um, I'd like for you at any given time to come back to this slide here. Uh, this is a, a great refresher of some of our terminology uh, and in general will help you uh, keep up with the specifics of what I'm saying. So first off, the two primary metrics that we here at ITR use in our forecasting are moving averages and rates of change. For our moving averages or moving totals, um, we have both the 12-month moving average or moving total and three-month moving average or moving total. You might hear me refer to these in their shorthand, either the 12-MMT or the 3-MMT, respectively. The 12-month moving total, or uh, the annual total, is simply a rolling total of the most recent 12 months of data. When this data makes sense to sum up, for example, uh, sales numbers uh, or units shipped, we use the 12-month moving total. When we're looking at things such as indexes, which don't necessarily make sense to sum up, we use uh, the moving averages instead. And the reason we use the annual moving average, uh, or the 12 MMT or MMA, is to help smooth out the data. Uh, again, as long-term business cycle theorists, we're not so concerned with month-to-month -month movement, as there is inherent vol uh, volatility within any company uh, activity or market activity from month to month. We're more concerned with the long-term long -term trends uh, and the general directional movement of the overall uh, economic activity. Because of this, we use the 12-month moving av uh, activity to uh, smooth out the data and get a uh, nice long-term view of what is happening. 
Much to that note, then we also have the three-month moving total or three-month moving average. Uh, and as it is simply the most recent three months of data uh, aggregated together, it is more volatile than the 12-month moving total. And while that makes it uh, more prone to sending um, false or misleading signals on a short-term basis, it does help uh, give us an early indication of where the quarterly activity is going. After we have our data trends or our moving averages, we move over to our rates of change. Our rates of change are our primary forecasting uh, metrics here at ITR. And each of the 12 mm and the 3 mm have a uh, correlated or analogous rate of change. For example, we have our 12, uh, 12 rate of change. You also hear me refer to it as our annual rate of change. Uh, and what this is, it's simply the most recent 12 mmt compared to the 12 mmt one year ago, or more simply, the, most, uh, the change between the most recent 12 months of data compared to the 12 months before that. Uh, you'll also hear me call this our year-over-year -year growth rate, and this is what we use uh, to forecast different segments of the economy. Then we also have our 312, the analog to the 3MMT. The 312, again, is inherently a more volatile series than the 1212, and it helps to give us uh, early indications of directional changes within the 1212. Uh, in general, the 312 tends to lead the 1212 by a median of between three and five months, um, and this changes for different uh, aspects of the economy or different companies. But in general, once we see uh, the 312 rising above the 1212 on a chart and continuing to grow, that's generally a strong statistic indicator uh, that that 1212 is going to follow suit uh, within the next three to five months. Conversely, when the 312 uh, falls below the 1212, or downward passes it, as we often call it, uh, and is falling, that is uh, strong statistical evidence uh, that the 1212 is going to reach a cyclical peak. And the reason that we like to look at the 1212 is to help determine uh, the phase of the business cycle that any company or any segment of the economy is in. You can see in the bottom of my screen here uh, that we have this uh, nice sign curve in four different colors. And this represents the business cycle as defined by ITR. The business cycle has four distinct phases, uh, phase A, B, C, and D. Uh, and the first uh, portion of the business cycle is phase A recovery. You can see in the bottom left-hand curve of that picture, uh, in blue, is our visual description of phase A. Phase A is when the 1212 is below zero, which means that uh, the segment of the economy is contracting on a year-over-year -year basis and activity is below where it was during the same 12 months uh, one year prior. However, it's rising and it's moving up toward that zero line. Uh, we call this phase A recovery because it is the first phase of the business cycle where we're starting to move toward positivity. I like to think of it as the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, this is where uh, sales or economic activity is still down, but you're getting that first glimpse of, glimpse of positivity on the horizon. Once the 12-12 upward passes that zero line, it is expanding on a year-over-year -year basis, we transition to what we call phase B, accelerating growth. This is the best phase of the business cycle to be in, and again, it's when the 12-12 is above the zero line, so you're expanding on a year-over-year -year basis, and it is rising, so you're getting progressively uh, faster growth on a month-to-month -month basis. Once the 12-12 reaches a cyclical peak, as you can see in the middle of this sign graph we have here, we transition into phase C, slower growth of the business cycle. This is when the 12-12 is above zero, so you're still growing on a year-over-year -year basis, um, and things are still becoming progressively better. However, the growth rate is beginning to slow, and that 12 to 12 is falling back down toward the zero line. This is the cautionary phase of the business cycle, where activity is still increasing, uh, but you have to be aware that you may fall into phase D, recession, imminently. Phase D, recession, is uh, the worst phase of the business cycle to be in, and it's when the 12 to 12 has fallen below the zero line and is continuing to get more and more negative. So this is when economic activity is slowing uh, and declining, and it's declining at a faster pace as we move forward. However, we don't always see all four phases of the business cycle uh, progress nicely like this chart shows, one into the other, into the other, and then uh, repeating over and over. Instead, we can have what we consider a soft landing here at ITR, and this is where we transition from phase C, slower growth, so the 12-12 is moving down toward that zero line, 
However, it reaches a cyclical trough before falling below the zero line and transitions directly back to phase B, accelerating growth. Uh, this is the best economic activity we can hope for, and it generally occurs during economic boom times uh, in periods of overall macroeconomic acceleration. Conversely, we have the worst case scenario, which is a hard landing. This is where any segment of the economy is in phase A recovery, so that 12-12 is rising toward the zero line. However, it begins to slow and peaks before crossing above that zero line and falls directly back into phase D recession. Uh, much like the soft landings are generally seen during uh, economic boom times, we generally see this during uh, periods of uh, fundamental transition with any segment of the economy uh, or uh, during macroeconomic recessionary periods. So again, that's a general refresher on uh, the different methodologies and terminologies that I'll be using. Um, and again, I encourage you to go back and look at this slide uh, either at any time during my presentation uh, or afterward if you have any um, specific questions uh, relating to exactly what I was uh, saying. Next up, another common uh, economic indicator that we'll use is this theory of leading indicators. And a leading indicator is any indicator, for example, uh, retail sales is a leading indicator to many aspects of the economy, uh, that tends to either turn up or turn down before the economy or a company as a whole sees a correlated turn up. So you can see here that we have a generic um, basic indicator 112 here in this dark blue compared to a generic fictional company A in this light blue cyan color. You can see that the indicator reached a cyclical peak in March of 2010. However, the company didn't reach a cyclical 12-12 peak until one year later in March of 2011. And conversely, uh, in the next business cycle, in June of 2014 for the indicator, followed by June of 2015 for the company. Now, what that means is that we see a clear cyclical correlation here where any activity in the indicator tends to happen about one year on the median earlier than it does in the company. Ooh, and we lost a graphic here. But what we do here uh, with our leading indicators is that we shift them horizontally on the graph. So since this has a 12-month lead time, we'll take that indicator 112 and shift it horizontally to the right on the graph, essentially giving you 12 months of predictive power. Now, at any given time, uh, different aspects of the economy can give um, what we consider false signals uh, compared to their historical relationship, generally during times, as I mentioned before, of transition or of structural change within the economy. Because of that, we don't base our forecasting or our predictive powers on any one leading indicator, and we don't advise you to do the same either. Instead, we advise you to find a basket of leading indicators, uh, anywhere between four and seven, uh, that all have a good uh, logical correlation and cyclical correlation to either your company sales or the aspect of the economy that you're interested in. And once you see in between three, four, maybe even five of those indicators all turn the corner and either turn up or turn down, generally in lockstep, that's when you know that there is a change moving through the economy that is widespread enough that it is strong statistical evidence uh, that you're going to see that, uh, that correlated change within the aspect of the economy that you're interested in. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about U.S. industrial production. You can see U.S. industrial production here in the dark blue line. The orange line is the ITR leading indicator. The ITR leading indicator is a proprietary leading indicator developed by us here at ITR, and it's meant to uh, lead U.S. industrial production by between 7 to 12 months on the median. U.S. industrial production is one of our benchmarks for the U.S. economy as a whole, uh, and comprises about 30% of the economy. That fluctuates from year to year uh, based on the economic climate, but in general, it's a, it's a good benchmark for about one-third of the economy. It comprises three primary components, mining, utilities, and manufacturing. You can see that U.S. industrial production is currently down about 1.2% year over year, and it's been uh, contracting for the majority of 2016. Of those three components, only manufacturing, which is up about 0.3%, so no breakneck growth by any means, uh, is expanding. Mining and utilities are both down on a year-over-year -year basis. However, there is signs of positivity in the U.S. economy. 
uh, U.S. industrial production has ticked up. Uh, it reached a cyclical 12-12 low in October, uh, which signals a tentative transition to phase A recovery. In general, we look for three months of sustained 12-12 rise before declaring a definitive transition to a different phase. However, as you can see, oh, and we lost the graphic here again, but that's no problem. As you can see, this ITR leading indicator is currently shifted back uh, to show its real timing relationship. So this is uh, in real time what you see. However, if we were to shift this over on the graph, uh, the cyclical trough that occurred uh, about eight months ago in the ITR leading indicator lines up with the tentative October low that we saw in the 12-12. Uh, that's a strong supporting evidence that uh, this cyclical trough we've seen will persist and, uh, in the near term, and that transition to phase A recovery will persist through uh, the remainder of 2016 uh, into 2017 before transitioning to phase B accelerating growth. We're seeing some uh, strong positive signals from the U.S. industrial production quarterly growth rate. It's currently only down about 0.7%. Uh, and again, that upward passing uh, movement is further evidence that this phase A transition will hold in the near term. In general, we expect uh, strong activity from U.S. industrial production in 2017. We expect to see phase B accelerating growth by the second quarter persisting into early 2018. After that, we expect to see slower but persistent growth throughout 2018. This is uh, very encouraging. We're looking at uh, significant two years of growth uh, over the next two years. One of the reasons for uh, the depression or recession that we've seen over the past year and in late 2015 as well uh, is primarily due to headwinds from uh, the mining component of U.S. industrial production. Um, even if you have never watched the news, I'm sure uh, you have all seen what's happening with oil prices and how they fell through the floor um, in late 2015 and the majority of 2016. Um, and that decrease in commodity prices, which happened uh, with many metal prices such as uh, iron and steel as well, um, led to uh, decreased production in the mining side of things and was significant enough to drive U.S. industrial production into recession. This recovery comes at a time when the West Texas Intermediate Oil Price, uh, which is a strong benchmark for uh, U.S. oil prices in general, um, is now pushing the mid-$50 mark. Uh, which is generally considered a fairly healthy price level to encourage investment in the oil fields. As well, we've also seen uh, improvement in steel prices and copper prices and in metal prices in general, uh, which will help to give uh, stimulate investment and give some nice buoyant pressure to U.S. industrial production throughout 2017 moving into 2018. By 2019, we do expect uh, that positivity that we're seeing um, to trickle off, and we do expect U.S. industrial production to fall into recession, so back into phase D recession, uh, by the late first quarter or early second quarter of 2019. Now, I know saying recession um, often gets people on edge. Uh, we think of uh, the massive shock that the economy saw in 2008 moving to 2019, but I want to assuage, uh, assuage some of your fears here, where it's not going to be this capital R recession that hits um, every aspect of the economy. Instead, we expect to see mild single-digit contraction in U.S. industrial production. And what's happening is that this is generally going to be a consumer-led recession. Uh, so we expect the consumer real works to start slowing down. Uh, we expect a uh, cooler housing market and, in general, rising interest rates, all which tend to have um, negative effects on the economy as a whole. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, it will be a consumer-led economy, so those aspects of the economy, such as uh, food production uh, and things of that nature, retail sales, will be more heavily impacted and will generally be impacted earlier in 2019 um, than other uh, hard industrial uh, facets of the economy. Similar to the, the decline that we've seen in U.S. industrial production, uh, it's also been a tough year for U.S. non-defense capital goods new orders. That's a mouthful of a title, um, but basically capital goods new orders are, is our uh, benchmark for uh, the U.S. business-to-business -business economy or business-to-business -business activity. It comprises such things as uh, industrial machinery, agricultural machinery, um, office equipment, um, vehicle parts, 
things such as that. And it is a good indicator of the productive capacity of an economy. We have seen a uh, general phase A recovery trend in U.S. non-defense capital goods new orders um, since about four months ago. If you look in this chart here, you can see that the 1212 did tick down in October, um, which is a slightly worrying sign. However, we are seeing uh, general quarterly expansion or uh, rise in the quarterly growth rate. Um, and the 1212 hasn't fallen below that previous low. Uh, so all of these signs are pointing toward the recovery trend persisting uh, as the data for the end of 26 comes in, uh, followed by expansion by mid-2017 and again throughout 2018. Um, this is a similar story to what we saw on the industrial side of the economy. Uh, and basically, this has been a commodity price-driven decline. Um, the declining oil prices have seen depressed demand for oil field machinery, uh, things such as uh, derricks and rotary rig and rotary rig servicing. Uh, and because of that, we've seen a lot of weakness related to the mining industry. However, this has been more systemic, uh, and we've seen it throughout uh, many segments of the economy, even those uh, consumer sections of the economy that are traditionally sheltered from commodity price shocks. And the reason for that is that low iron and steel prices have uh, formed these negative pricing pressures, which have been putting general downward pressure on uh, corporate profits as uh, prices drop and companies are forced to essentially uh, compete down toward the zero profit line. So we've seen dimin uh, diminished marginal returns uh, and purchasing managers have been very skeptical of the returns on investment. And because of that, we've seen them delaying or pushing off um, a lot of large capital uh, purchases. Uh, they haven't been assured of the profitability of these large purchases. And because of that, they've essentially been doing more with less uh, throughout the majority of 2016. Uh, as metal prices are rising, we're seeing, again, some upward buoyancy on corporate profits. Uh, and we expect those um, profit margins to increase throughout 2017 as general inflationary pressures take hold. So we're hoping to see a general rebound effect here where a lot of the capital purchases that have been put off throughout the majority of 2016 uh, will start to be made um, at a faster clip in 2017, moving into 2018, um, as they essentially just can't be pushed off any longer. Uh, and the general economic growth climate encourages uh, optimism uh, and further promises of productivity. So while this is a uh, tough indicator for 2016, uh, that rise in the 12-12 does seem to be taking place and bodes very well for 2017. Again, uh, a very negative picture of the U.S. economy uh, on both the industrial and business business side of things. Uh, however, I want to draw your attention to U.S. gross domestic product. For those of you who are unaware, uh, gross domestic product is the most holistic picture uh, of any economy. It attempts to capture the entirety of U.S. economic activity. You can see in the left here, uh, this is the dollar-valued uh, nominal amount of gross domestic product and it has been generally rising since the wake of the uh, 2008 economic recession, about mid-2009. Uh, as well, you can see in the growth rate that we do expect it to see a cyclical trough without falling into phase D recession, uh, so that nice soft landing that we like to see in the economy, followed by accelerating growth into 2018. So this begs the question, if we're expecting to see it finish uh, strong about 1.9 to 2% growth in 2016, followed by accelerating growth throughout 2017 into 2018, where does this weakness come from? Well, it comes from the fact that in the U.S. economy, broken into three major productive uh, sections, uh, the U.S. consumer is king. Personal consumption expenditures make up nearly two-thirds as of 2014 of the entire U.S. economy. Uh, by comparison, business investment, uh, so that U.S. non-defense capital goods metric, makes up only a paltry 16%, followed by government spending at 18%. So you can see that while uh, weakness in the industrial and business-to-business -business sectors were enough to uh, drag down the overall growth rate within U.S. GDP, it wasn't enough to pull it into contractionary territory. Uh, because in general, wherever the U.S. consumer goes, uh, so too goes the overall U.S. economy. 
which brings us to consumer activity uh, just by the numbers. Here we have U.S. total retail sales uh, deflated. And what I mean by deflated is that we've accounted for any inflationary or deflationary pressures in order to get the real value of how much economic activity is going on on the consumer side of things, um, as opposed to anything that may be inflationary or pricing related in nature. You can see, uh, even though it is deflated, uh, U.S. total retail sales are expanding 2.0% uh, year over year, uh, which is a uh, relatively strong growth rate. And you can see it has been expanding since um, generally the wake of the U.S. economic recession in 2008. We expect U.S. total retail sales, even though they are generally slowing, to avoid recession. Uh, and much with our general macroeconomic uh, outlook for the majority of uh, the U.S. in 2017, we expect to see that similar nice phase B accelerating growth trends. Uh, there are various consumer, uh, strong consumer trends that are driving um, this U.S. consumer spending. Uh, the first and probably strongest being uh, private sector employment growth. Uh, U.S. private sector employment, uh, which we use as a benchmark for uh, overall employment growth in the U.S. economy, is currently up 2.0% year over year. It's in phase C, slower growth, uh, but we expect it to persist into 2017 without falling into recession. You can also see that the job openings are up 7.0%. And what that means is that U.S. companies are actively looking for employees. They are looking to expand the productive capacity of the U.S. economy. That is a very beneficial uh, sign. Uh, if you read the news and listen to a lot of political pundits, um, oftentimes the U.S. employment and unemployment rate is called into question um, because it is calculated in a variety of different ways. For example, uh, the benchmark U.S. unemployment rate that you see um, quoted in the Wall Street Journal or New York Times or on Fox News um, doesn't differentiate between part-time employment, for example, uh, a retail job where you only work 18 hours a week, um, in a salaried full-time position. This can be misleading uh, because oftentimes there are strong economic incentives um, to drive people toward those generally more profitable uh, full-time salary positions or full-time wage positions as opposed to the uh, less reliable, um, more volatile uh, part-time employment. What we saw in the wake of the 2008 recession um, was actually a rise in the employment rate, uh, or a decrease in the unemployment rate, if you will, uh, for a significant portion of time. And what was happening here is that we saw a rise in involuntary part-time employment, also known as uh, part-time employment for economic reasons. And you, could, you can imagine this as uh, a U.S. worker, uh, let's imagine in the auto industry that was hit very hard by the 2008 recession. Uh, let's say that they lose their job. Uh, and are unable to find a new comparable job within their field due to the ongoing economic weakness. Because of this, they might take two, maybe even three part-time jobs in order to make up for that weakness. Uh, and just based on the unemployment rate by the numbers, that will actually uh, essentially show as a net wash. And we'll see that rise in, in uh, employment and that decrease in unemployment, uh, even though they're generally lower skilled, uh, less economically valu valuable jobs. But I have good news here in that the involuntary part-time employment is down 7.1% year over year. Uh, that's the lowest 12-month moving average in nearly eight years. So not only are we seeing uh, job growth and job openings, these are generally economically viable and economically desirable jobs as well. However, um, as with many economic movements, uh, there is a downside or a potential risk factor uh, involved in a tightening labor market. You can see that private sector employment growth is up 2.0%, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, however, job openings are outpacing that. And what this means is that employers are having uh, a hard time filling new vacant positions. Because of that, uh, we're seeing a tightening tightening labor market, and we expect to see rising wages throughout 2017 and into 2018. Uh, because of this, uh, you must, you must, it is vital uh, that you budget for rising labor costs throughout the year, uh, because it is useless to take advantage of overall economic growth uh, if your wages are rising faster than your productivity, which results in a net negative. 
Also, we are seeing the quit rate rising. Uh, the quit rate is um, very simply explained. It's just the average rate at which U.S. workers quit their jobs. Uh, it can seem a little counterintuitive to see a rising quit rate during a time of uh, rising employment. But what is happening here is that the U.S. consumer is seeing that there are jobs available. Because of that, uh, they are perhaps looking for um, new jobs that either give better benefits packages or better wages, or perhaps simply um, will let them live in a more desirable area. When you see this quit, rising, uh, quit rate rising, it's vital that you focus on employee retention and satisfaction, job satisfaction. Uh, especially with uh, the younger so-called millennial generation um, that's really taking hold of the workforce right now and will continue to do so in the near future. Um, they have what they have economic incentives that have been vexing a lot of managers and a lot of hiring managers. Basically, they are less concerned with traditional metrics of a good job, such as um, high pay uh, and the, the standard nine to five salary position, and instead are very incentivized by a bunch of um, generally unconventional metrics. For example, um, they want to see that their job is important and that it has impact um, either on the environment or on their society as a whole. Also, they're very strongly incentivized by uh, non-traditional work hours and perhaps uh, more flexible hours or dress codes or even more time off. And the reason I mention this uh, is because as we see rising labor costs, if you can find ways to increase employee retention and employee job satisfaction without simply giving them uh, higher bonuses or higher pay, it will help you to uh, increase that retention while decreasing or mitigating that rise in labor costs. So generally positive for uh, the economy is this tightening labor market and this expanding workforce. Uh, however, you must be aware that it comes with uh, some potential risk factors uh, on the hiring side of things. <clears throat> so that is our general outlook for the overall U.S. economy. Uh, and now I'd like to get a little more fine-grained uh, and talk about a few different uh, uh, specific markets uh, that we forecast for PMMI uh, in which will be uh, vital to keep your uh, finger on the pulse of moving through 2018. Here we have uh, U.S. pharmaceutical and medical device production. Uh, it is currently up 2.2% uh, year over year and is in a phase B accelerating growth trend. I'll draw your attention to the uh, chart on the right side of this uh, on the right side of this slide because you can see that uh, U.S. pharmaceutical and medical device production uh, is due for an imminent cyclical peak and tra uh, transition to phase C, slower growth. So we are moving towards that cautionary phase of the business cycle uh, within the medical device field. Um, however, we will generally avoid recession throughout 2018, uh, moving to 2019. You can see our data trends on the left over here, where the 12-month moving average is expected to rise throughout 2018. It will stagnate in uh, the second half of 2018 a little bit uh, before picking up again. Um, as I mentioned, that there are strong consumer trends uh, driving uh, the retail sales side of things. Uh, anyone involved in the medical industry has U.S. demographics on their side. We have an aging workforce uh, and the share of the U.S. population that is above 65 or 65 years or older is increasing and will do so over really the next decade. The reason this is important for the medical community is because this is where uh, the lion's share of U.S healthcare costs are incurred, uh, and that fact that we have more people who are uh, in the more medically intensive phase of their life will help to uh, drive persistent growth within this field and keep it out of recession over at, next, uh, over at least the next three years. You can see that we expect uh, 2017 to peak uh, or to close at 1.4% year-over-year growth, uh, followed by a uh, slightly slower uh, about 1% growth rate throughout 20, uh, 2018. Uh, again, despite the overall recession we are expecting for 2019, we do expect pharmaceutical and medical device production to generally expand during that time period. Uh, so definitely a, an area of growth and perhaps an area to uh, double down in if you have involvement here.
Next, we have U.S. food production. You can see that U.S. food production, similar to pharmaceutical production, is in phase B accelerating growth. Uh, it's currently up 1.8% year over year. Uh, and we'll also reach a cyclical transition to phase C, slower growth over the next quarter. Uh, very similar story here. Instead of an aging demographic, you have uh, the new workforce coming in and uh, wages and employment rising, uh, which will help to, again, keep this segment of the economy out of recession through at least 2018. And we do expect to see some general upward movement in 2019 as well. Uh, what we are seeing is both uh, growth on the retail and restaurant side of things. Um, so restaurant and drinking establishments and bars uh, are seeing increased spending and patronage, uh, as well as uh, your traditional retail grocery stores. However, there is a uh, marginal risk factor within the food industry, and that's that um, a wide basket, a wide array of uh, agricultural uh, prices have been uh, depressed throughout most of 2016. And as we saw with oil and metal on the industrial side of things, uh, we're seeing low food prices put some negative pricing pressures on a lot of different aspects uh, of the food economy as well. Uh, for example, we're seeing it in milk and cheese. Moving through 2017 and 2018, as we expect general growth, uh, if you are involved in one of these segments uh, of the U.S. food industry that are seeing decreasing prices, um, it's critical that you uh, maintain a competitive pricing scheme. Uh, and try and either match or undercut that of your uh, local major competitors. Uh, with the economy growing like this and expecting uh, general macroeconomic uh, headwinds in 2019, uh, we want you to focus on market share over margins for the next two years. Uh, and that will help lead to a longer, uh, longer term, healthier outlook for your company uh, as opposed to prioritizing short term gain. Here we have U.S. Personal Care Products Production Index. Uh, and again, you can see that we have very similar growth characteristics uh, to both pharmaceuticals and U.S. food production. Uh, another Phase B accelerating growth trend, currently up 3.0% year over year, uh, and again with an imminent Phase C transition. Now, there is a mild risk uh, of, mild contractionary, uh, of a mild contractionary environment moving into the second half of 2017. Uh, however, any contraction here will be, as I mentioned before, uh, generally mild and relatively brief. Uh, we don't expect to see a general recession within this industry, and we do expect to see 1.1% year-over-year growth uh, throughout 2017, followed by accelerating growth throughout 2018, uh, ending the year up 3.8% year-over-year. So if you begin to see uh, activity drop in this segment uh, and perhaps uh, some decrease in your sales, it is vital that while you see that, uh, you look forward instead of uh, look to the short term. And we want you to project uh, both confidence and optimism to both your clients and your employees. Uh, this will help you to keep uh, retention rates up uh, and will help you to maintain your productive capacity in anticipation of uh, generally favorable tailwinds throughout the majority of 2018 into 2019. Next, we have beverages, coffee, and tea production. This is a uh, subsector of U.S. food production, uh, and because of that, you also see this imminent transition to phase C, slower growth. Beverages, coffee, and tea production, uh, and beverages do cover both alcoholic and non-alcoholic beverages, are currently up 3.3% year over year, and we expect general growth moving into 2018, with only a mild risk of uh, deflationary pressures in the second half of 2018. However, you can see, uh, despite the uh, rapid growth rate that we see in this left side of the chart uh, from late 2015 through 2016, we do expect to see uh, generally decreased growth rates moving throughout 2018. While an overall positive, uh, it's important that if you want to uh, realize uh, the rise in profits that uh, correlates with this rise in ec economic in uh, activity excuse me, uh, in the beverage, coffee, and tea production sector of the economy, uh, that you want to start analyzing the marginal benefit of your different product lines um, and find the winners and the losers. Uh, this is a time where growth is slowing and you want to ditch the losers and double down on both marketing and selling uh, your higher margin products.
slide, we have U.S. chemicals in cleaning products production. This segment of the economy comprises both uh, industrial solvents and cleaners, uh, for example, that would be used in um, large uh, food production facilities uh, or on certain kinds of mining equipment, and it also includes uh, consumer-driven uh, household cleaning equipment, such as uh, window cleaners or bleach, um, anything like that that you'd find at a Walmart or a Lowe's. It's in phase C, slower growth, the cautionary phase of the business cycle, and is up 1.0% year over year. Uh, we expect uh, mild deflationary pressures uh, moving into uh, mid-2017, but in general, this will be a growth segment. You can see based on the 12 MMA that any growth will be uh, very mild, basically remaining virtually flat over the next two quarters uh, before expansion takes hold through 2018. Uh, there are two different stories being told within the chemicals and cleaning products production side of the economy, uh, and that's, again, of the industrial side and the consumer side. Uh, the consumer side is generally outperforming the industrial side, and you will want to focus on uh, capturing market share uh, within the consumer side over the next three quarters until U.S. industrial production uh, really begins to uh, pick up and start accelerating in the second half of 2017. On this slide, we have U.S. durables, hard goods, components, and parts production. Uh, that's a very generally vague uh, term, so I know that it can be confusing. But in general, what this segment of the economy comprises is uh, anything that is produced with the anticipation uh, of having a lifespan of three years or over. Uh, this has things such as cars, computers, uh, household appliances, and furniture, for example. It's in a phase C slower growth trend. However, we have seen some early upward movement in the 12-12, which is currently up 1.1% year over year, uh, signaling a tentative transition to phase B accelerating growth. This is in line with our expectations for this segment of the economy, and you can see that we expect acceleration uh, to take hold imminently into early 2018, finishing 2017 up about 3.9%, uh, excuse me, 2.9%. Uh, followed by slightly depressed growth rates throughout the remainder of 2018. Again, you should be focusing uh, wherever possible on consumer-led segments um, within this uh, aspect of the economy. Um, we see stronger growth in appliance production, uh, automobile sales, and parts production, um, and also uh, things such as furniture, uh, furniture and um, hardware for uh, household hardware. Hey Chris, this is Rebecca. Um, I do want to just go back one slide for a moment. We have a question from um, one of our attendees um, on the slide previous to this, the chemicals. Uh, the question is, does this include detergent? Um, and that's it. Does, that, does this uh, include detergent? Um, that's a great question. Uh, thank you for submitting it. Uh, it does not, in fact, include detergents. Uh, detergents and soaps are included in their own segment. Uh, however, we are generally seeing similar trend characteristics within that aspect of the economy. Excellent. <clears throat> and I'd just like to remind anyone that if they do have questions, to please feel free to leave them in the chat box at the lower uh, left-hand corner of your screen. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, and thank you for the question as well. Now I'm going to start moving into our uh, general international overview. You can see here that I have Canada Industrial Production, uh, one of the U.S.'s uh, largest trading partners and uh, obviously our largest neighbor. Uh, the trend characteristics between U.S. industrial production and Canada industrial production are very similar. Canada industrial production is uh, currently in phase, uh, this is incorrect, phase A, uh, recovery of the business cycle. Uh, however, it is underperforming the U.S. economy uh, just because of its increased reliance on uh, mineral and oil mining. Again, we expect uh, general positivity in 2017 with an accelerating growth trend lasting into early 2018. However, we expect recessionary uh, headwinds a little earlier than we do uh, on the U.S. side of things. So if you do have exposure to business in Canada, um, start planning for decreased economic activity uh, by uh, the fourth quarter of 2018, as opposed to the first or second quarter of 2019. 
Now I'll bring you down to a general overview of North American industrial production as a whole. Uh, you can see not a very promising picture, uh, a lot of red here, uh, with Canada and the U.S. and uh, those kind of cusps of the phase A recovery, uh, and with Mexico virtually even with the year before. Uh, Mexico's economy is doing relatively well compared to a lot of North America, uh, as their attractive labor force and low wages, uh, coupled with um, cheaper regulatory pressures, are attracting a lot of manufacturing business from both the U.S. and Canada. You can see uh, that we expect uh, Latin American industrial production uh, down in South America to uh, generally recover throughout 2017, finishing the year um, just up 0.5%, about even with 2016, um, followed by stronger growth throughout 2018. Again, here you can see a lot of red, uh, but there are winners and losers. Uh, Argentina, Chile, and Peru uh, are all on those uh, recovery trends that we expect to see uh, and that we see in North America as well. And they will um, begin accelerating earlier than uh, both Ecuador and Brazil in the first half of 2017. Uh, Brazil is an area of concern, uh, and if you have product lines focused toward this area, um, you may want to uh, start, again, dropping the uh, marginal product lines and thinking about expanding your geographic reach um, between their dependence on uh, fossil fuels and also uh, political upheaval that we've seen uh, they are far underperforming um, their neighbors and will continue to do so throughout 2017. Uh, Colombia, with a fairly well diversified uh, both agricultural and manufacturing side of things, is up 4.0%. Uh, target Colombia in 2017 uh, if you are able to. Next we'll move into Europe Industrial Production Index. It's in phase C, slower growth, and is up 1.3% year over year. A lot of these countries have a uh, reduced dependency on profits from uh, both oil and mineral mining uh, compared to the majority of North America and South America. And because of this, they'll generally avoid recession in this business cycle. We ex uh, expect acceleration through 2017, again, driven by strong consumer trends on the retail side of things, followed by slower growth in 2018. You can see a lot of green here. Uh, so in general, if you're involved in any of the um, primary economic drivers of Europe, uh, be it UK, Germany, or France, um, Spain, and Italy, uh, those will all be general, uh, will generally facilitate economic growth uh, over the next two to three years. However, uh, some of the Eastern European countries, such as Estonia and Moldova, uh, with less mature, diversified economies, are seeing some mild contraction uh, as well as Norway, uh, due to their increased exposure to the oil markets. Again, signs of positivity, which is refreshing compared to a lot of the negativity that I've spoken about today uh, in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia industrial production is currently up 1.4% year over year. Uh, it's fallen into a phase C, slower growth trend, but will transition back to phase B imminently and will generally expand through 2018. Despite a lot of ongoing concerns earlier in the year uh, regarding the viability of China sustaining those about 5 to 6 percent growth rates, China has accelerate, uh, transitioned to phase B accelerating growth uh, and is expected to accelerate through the remainder of 2017. Uh, a lot of their major trading partners and a lot of the uh, smaller countries around them are benefiting uh, from that economic growth that we're seeing. Uh, and I like to think of Southeast Asia as the old adage, uh, a rising tide lifts all boats. Um, as long as we see general growth in China, we expect to see some positivity uh, with a lot of their neighbors as well. You can see two major excep uh, exceptions to that. Japan, down 1.3%. And India, down 0.5%. Japan has been struggling with uh, an aging demographic more severe than that of the U.S., uh, and uh, much more severe than most of the developed economies in the world. Uh, and because of that, they've seen uh, depressed retail spending um, and very, uh, a lot of hesitance to invest on the business-to-business -business side of things. Um, Shinzo Abe has enacted uh, historic negative, growth, uh, negative interest rates, excuse me, uh, but so far it has not been enough to kickstart the Japanese economy. Uh, this is definitely a nation to watch in 2017 for early signs of recovery. Uh, although it will generally underperform compared to the rest of its Southeast Asian neighbors. 
India as well in a very mild economic recession right now, which will not likely persist um, through mid-2017, uh, has been hit by uh, pressures from two sides. Uh, we've seen decreased capital goods production. Um, that's been due to a lot of uh, decreased imports um, from both Europe and the U.S. Uh, and also their recent governmental demonetization scheme, uh, where they outlawed uh, various large bills uh, and essentially wiped out a lot of the cash reserves that are publicly held in India. Uh, this mostly impacted consumer tied aspects of the economy because uh, they have traditionally a very cash heavy uh, activity. So expect uh, weakness throughout the first half of 2017 uh, in areas such as um, consumer durable goods and also the automobile industry for India. However, again, this is a relatively mild economic recession and we do expect it to uh, transition back to year over year growth um, by the second half of 2017. I've included a list here for all of you of actions to take before the 2019 recession. Again, uh, when it comes to long-term business cycle planning, we want to take advantage of economic uh, boom years while predicting, preparing for, and ultimately mit uh, mitigating decline uh, during the back side of the business cycle. So I encourage you to take a look at uh, these 10 bullet points uh, that I've put for you. Uh, depending on your exposure to different aspects of the economy, uh, they won't all apply to everyone. Um, however, uh, in general, they are uh, safer, stronger management objectives for the next two years. I'm going to skip over these for now um, because I would like to uh, hand it back to Rebecca uh, and leave some time for questions. Uh, so thank you all for joining me today and listening in on our first quarter of 2017 market forecast webinar. Uh, and Rebecca, if we have any questions, I will kick them back to you. Chris, thank you so much for the great reflection of the current economy and issues at hand for packaging and processing industry. We do have a few questions, so I will, I will share those with everyone. Um, but I would also like to open this up for questions from others. Please feel free to enter your questions in the chat box at the bottom left hand of your screen. Um, but we'll get started on what we have so far. So um, first question is, are you expecting the dollar to keep strengthening in 2017? Um, great. Uh, again, thank you for the question. Um, we do expect uh, a stronger dollar in 2017. Um, generally, with the rise in uh, commodity prices, uh, as well as um, higher interest rates expected by the Fed. We do expect to see some upward momentum for the dollar, uh, but we don't expect to see it grow as fast as it did in 2016. Um, so if you're uh, sensitive to fluctuations in the U.S. dollar, um, you'll have to plan for general strengthening, uh, but nothing like what we saw in 2016. Okay, great. Um, we also um, did have a request for you to show your final slide again, if you could back up and, and do that. Um, uh, our next question, I think it's this one, yes. Great. Um, our next question is, what, uh, what's the expectation for GDP growth for 2019 and ahead? In 2019, we expect, um, in line with our expectation of uh, a recession on both the consumer and industrial side of things, we do expect a uh, mild single-digit contraction, uh, so a mild U.S. economic uh, recession in 2019. But we expect uh, GDP recovery by the end of 2019, uh, followed by general growth in tw uh, 2020 moving to 2021. We don't have hard and fast numbers forecasted for those years yet, but based on bus uh, basic business cycle movements and uh, economic, uh, the economic cyclical nature of things, uh, 2020 and 2021 should be growth years. Excellent. Thank you. Um, there's a couple things that we've had people ask to confirm. Um, one thing is that a questioner would like to, for you to confirm that you said um, for the food and food prep industry that it's important to emphasize market share over margins. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, I will caveat that. That is primarily for um, aspects of the food production side of the economy um, that are currently being subjected to these negative pricing pressures. Um, again, think uh, dairy, milk and cheese, 
because we do expect general growth over the next two years. Uh, and so we'd rather you be in a strong market position moving the 2019 recession as opposed to uh, prioritizing growth now uh, and being hit by both uh, business cycle decline and general economic decline in 2019. Okay, great. Um, we also had someone ask if you could confirm one of your sources listed as FRB as being Federal Reserve Board. That is correct. Okay, great. Um, I have another question here. Um, actually, a couple of people are, are asking about this. Um, do you think that the proposed economic and trade policies of the new administration will help or uh, hurt uh, the U.S. economy? That is a great question, uh, but again, I am going to give you a little forewarning and a little caveat here. Um, that here at ITR Economics, we are an economic and business cycle forecasting firm. We are not a political forecasting firm. Uh, because of that, we don't speak to uh, the possibility of different um, political or presidential changes. Uh, we simply don't forecast those as quantitatively. Um, there is no agreed upon robust methodology for that. However, what we have seen a lot of talk of, uh, whether it comes to fruition, uh, for example, is a repeal of NAFTA. Uh, if NAFTA were to be repealed, there would be winners and losers, as is often the case uh, within the U.S. economy. Um, we'd expect to see uh, some boosts to uh, U.S. auto and mining workers uh, who have seen a lot of their uh, business move to both uh, Canada excuse me, and Mexico. However, in general, in the long term, that would most likely put uh, general downward pressure on U.S. economic growth. Uh, so that's a risk factor. Uh, however, with President-elect Trump coming into office, he has um, talked a lot about large, large infrastructure spending projects. Um, while a lot of numbers have been thrown around, none have been hammered down or officially proposed yet. Um, but increased infrastructure sp uh, spending, which in a lot of parts of the U.S. is direly needed, um, would give a uh, significant boost to the U.S. economy and it is in line with their expectations uh, for growth during the first half of uh, President-elect Trump's um, uh, term. Also, uh, after the results of the election, we have seen uh, inflationary signals uh, from the bond, mar uh, from the bond uh, market. Again, uh, this is signaling uh, expectations of inflation and general economic growth. Uh, which goes to show that on the private side, there are general expectations um, of positivity uh, from, the, uh, from the, the new election results. So in general, it supports our expectation uh, for 2017 and 2018 uh, at the risk of increased spending coupled with tax cuts, which in the short term most likely won't uh, have that much effect on the U.S. economy. Um, but moving into 2019 and beyond, um, that ballooning of the deficit that would result from these large spending projects coupled with uh, lower uh, corporate tax rates um, would present a risk that would have to be dealt with. Um, so if that sounds like a uh, complicated answer, uh, it's just simply because there are a lot of different um, potential growth areas and potential risk areas that we're looking forward to. However, if I had to boil it down to two statements, um, I would say that the political results look like positivity over the next two years, um, followed by uh, mild inflationary and uh, deficit risks moving through that. Okay, great. We do, uh, as I'm sure you can imagine, have quite a few questions about the incoming administration, um, but I think you've, you've answered those, you know, right now to the best of your ability. Um, d have you... However, have you looked at um, the implementation of new tariffs on manufacturing? Has that been taken account yet into your analysis? Uh, we have looked into the potential ramifications uh, of protective tariffs, um, and those are nothing new for the U.S. economy. Um, for example, in the first quarter of uh, 2016, of last year now, I should say, uh, we saw uh, massive, massive tariffs uh, levied protectively against Chinese steel. Um, they were accused of dumping below cost, uh, which is against um, international trade policies. And because of that, we saw uh, really about 200% uh, protective tariffs at one point. 
Um, in general, what that does is it uh, increases reliance on U.S. manufacturers, uh, which tend to, tends to have, uh, again, winners and losers. Uh, there is economic positivity, um, for example, in uh, the Rust Belt, uh, in different manufacturing terms, uh, towns, excuse me, but at the cost of uh, increased prices and downward pressures on uh, U.S. disposable personal income uh, and oftentimes on retail sales. Um, we haven't factored that into our analysis or our quantitative forecasts yet, uh, mainly because, as I mentioned before, we do not predict um, political uh, changes within the economy. So we are waiting to see any actions taken by uh, President-elect Trump uh, or, his, um, or his colleagues to actually hit within the data, um, probably moving into the first half of 2017. We'll start to see whether or not that affects our outlook significantly or not. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, just a couple more questions here. Um, one question is, why do you expect such growth in the EU in general if there are so many economic problems uh, within the EU? That's a good question. Um, one of the strongest aspects of the EU, uh, especially in um, Western Europe, uh, is that they tend to be very mature, uh, non-resource dependent markets. Uh, they have very few trade barriers, and because of that, they benefit from uh, long-term trade, and they're simply moving on to the upside of their business cycle. A lot of the weakness that we've seen uh, globally, especially in North and South America, has been commodity-driven, uh, especially with the oil prices. Uh, and so you can see that there are pocket, pockets of weakness um, related to that. Uh, but in general, they're going to outperform uh, a lot of the U.S., because those upward pressures from uh, consumer spending and a strong labor market, which they have as well, um, simply isn't competing with uh, the same headwinds from the mining industry, uh, just because it's a relatively smaller portion of their economy. Uh, again, a lot of the problems concerning the EU right now are uh, very speculative. There are uh, heavy political risks involved in um, potential Russian aggression, uh, as we saw in uh, the Ukraine, um, and that we expect to see in various Baltic states. Uh, again, this is moving more into the political side of things, and uh, those threats haven't hit the data yet, and so we haven't accounted for those, but it is a definite risk factor. Uh, also, Brexit, the uh, Brexit referendum, depending on how that plays out over really the next two years uh, based on the timeline put down by uh, the British government, um, that could have significant ramifications for uh, not only the UK, uh, but Europe as a whole. As uh, one of uh, the largest economies in the region, um, one of the risks they see is uh, both a decrease in uh, migration, both in and out of uh, Britain, uh, and heavier tariffs. Uh, so that will put um, some downward pressure, pressure on the labor market where they're unable to import relatively cheaper labor um, from other uh, areas of Europe, especially Eastern Europe, which will drive up prices um, and uh, generally hinder growth uh, within the country. And also if the EU decides to levy protective tariffs um, if and when they remove themselves from the EU, uh, that will also have uh, inflationary pressures without uh, related economic growth. Um, which risks kind of a uh, uh, stagflation, as we saw in the uh, 70s and 80s in the U.S. Um, but again, so those, while those are risk factors that we are keeping our finger on and keeping an eye on, um, most of it is political and speculative in nature at this point, and because of that, we are waiting to see it translate over into the actual numbers. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, one more question that we have here. Uh, will rising interest rates negatively affect consumer spending? That's a good question. Um, in general, yes. However, the uh, impact on the consumer side of the economy will likely be marginal compared to the business, uh, business to business side of the economy. Um, Far and above the strongest driver of uh, consumer activity and U.S. retail sales is going to be uh, wage growth and uh, disposable personal income. Um, we do expect to see uh, wages growing throughout 2017, 
Um, inflation, inflationary pressures really haven't taken hold yet, but by the end of 2017, they will be present. Uh, but overall, uh, we expect to see wages outpace inflationary pressures and that rise in the interest rate. Um, so I wouldn't worry about that on the consumer side of the economy. Um, it's really on the business-to-business -business side where they're borrowing to make um, multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars or million-dollar uh, capital purchases um, where those interest rates really can make or break the decision on a corporate level. Okay, great. That's, that's actually all the questions we have, Chris. Um, I'd like to thank you for a really great presentation. Um, on behalf of PMMI, thank you for participating today. And as a final note, um, everyone who attended will receive an email to complete an evaluation on today's webinar. Please complete the very short evaluation as soon as possible and let us know how we can improve future webinars. Um, this will be posted on PMMI.org and slides will be made available to everyone who attended uh, probably within the next day or two. Um, and that's all. Thank you so much for attending and thank you so much, Chris. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, and if anyone has any further questions that we didn't get to, uh, or if they come up with them uh, you know, later in the day or the week, feel free to forward them over to me uh, and I'd love to answer them for you. I will definitely do that. Thank you so much and thank you everyone for attending.